Canada West Foundation's Arthur E.E. E. Child pop-up policy session on the pandemic, women, and jobs. The pandemic has had many effects, but today we're going to talk about the impact on women and employment what it, and what it means for women going forward. But before we start with our outstanding panel, I want to welcome everyone in the call. I'm especially pleased to have some, some new um, attendees to our webinar who haven't been on our regular uh, Canada West Foundation pop-up policy sessions. And so welcome, and it's great to have you on the call. We do these pop-up policy sessions. They actually are a pop-up because they're relatively short notice, they're timely topics, and I want to thank our uh, panelists because we put it together in pretty short order. So thank you to them for, for making themselves available on, on short notice. Um, our objective is, is this is a big topic. And in some respects, it's very um, frustrating to, to try and address it within an hour. But our objective is to provide bite-sized insights. And those of you that are in the lunchtime time zone, um, I'm sorry to use a bite-sized reference. You're probably hopefully eating your lunch as you're listening. Um, basically, bite-sized insights from experts. So you'll walk away, you'll, everybody will learn something, I'm sure. I know I expect to. For those of you who don't know the Canada West Foundation, we're a donor-supported, nonprofit, independent public policy think tank. We do research, we make recommendations, and we convene people to identify where we need to go in this country of ours. Uh, we're the only public policy shop that focuses on the issues of importance to the West specifically. So welcome to folks who are across the West. I know we have some registrants from other parts of Canada and even a few hearty souls from the US. So welcome everyone. If you'd like to learn more about the Canada West Foundation or you'd like to subscribe to our list so that you can learn about when our next pop-up session will be held, you can visit our website, cwf.ca, Canada West Foundation, cwf.ca, and look for the subscribe button. So today's discussion, just for everyone's information, is going to be recorded. So if you want to look back and, and review something, or if you talk about it and someone says, oh, I really wish I'd seen it, please feel free to share it. The link will be posted on our website, likely tomorrow. The chat is on, and uh, with 236, 60, 266 participants already having joined, I'm afraid we won't be able to take questions from our participants, but please feel free to put your comments in the chat and we will be uh, forwarding all the chat comments to our speakers after the presentation. So today we have a very interesting group of speakers. I'm not gonna go through their bios because that would be the entire session. And so I'd like to welcome Minister Rajan Sani. She's the Minister of Community and Social Services for Alberta and a member of the Alberta Legislature for Northeast Calgary. We have from Manitoba, Sheila North and her lovely grandson, Adonis. There he is. <laughs> Sheila is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Legacy Bows, an Indigenous-owned organizational and HR consultants. And I know she looks way too young, but she's a former Grand Chief of Manitoba, Kiwatanawi, Oki Makana. From Saskatchewan, we have Melissa Coomber Benson. Melissa is the CEO of the Regina YWCA. And we have another YWCA-er. Welcome to Amy Juska from the Lower Mainland of, of BC. She's their Director of Communications and Advocacy. We also have, and unfortunately, Marcella was not on the original invite, so we have a bonus guest today, bonus panelist. Marcella uh, Mandeville is the CEO of Alberta Women Entrepreneurs, and she's also the chair of Women Entrepreneurship Organizations of Canada. And last but not least, we have our own Janet Lane, the director of the Human Capital Center from the Canada West Foundation. So with that, let's get started. We have a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to start with Minister Sani. Minister, I'd like you to set the scene for us. You know, as the 
Minister of the Crown and an MLA, you have a perspective from the highest level through the government service provider, as well as an MLA, you're in touch, I know, with many individuals across the province. So could you set the scene for us and kind of give us the big picture on how the pandemic has affected women and their employment? Thank you, Colleen. And let me begin by saying that it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to all my distinguished uh, co-panelists for joining today as well. There is no doubt that the pandemic has extensively disrupted lives. The global impact has been devastating and we're not on the other side of it yet. And there are numerous publications that can attest to this. I've read them all, whether it's a Women in the Workplace study by McKinsey, the RBC Human Capital Report, the Feminist Economic Recovery Plan for Canada, which is co-authored by the YWCA Canada, or many other op-eds and publications that discuss the issues from different perspectives. Now we have over a year's worth of data and discussions to know definitively that the impact on women has been highly disproportionate and will continue unless abatement measures are put in place. I'm not going to get into the, into the statistics because the reality is, is that we don't have to look far beyond the stories of the women in our lives to understand the impact. Our mothers, sisters, daughters, friends, community members, we know that the impacts of the pandemic on women have been significant. And I have several lenses with which I view these issues from my vantage point. One as MLA for Calgary Northeast, one of the hardest hit areas in the nation, the earliest hotspot in the continent for COVID-19. The stories and plight of women who worked at the Cargill meat plant and at the Amazon warehouse are heartbreaking. I also view these issues from the lens of Minister of Community and Social Services caring for the most vulnerable populations in our province and witnessing the intersectionality of the impacts on persons with disabilities, persons living below the poverty line, and persons impacted by increasing acts of hate and xenophobia. Finally, I have an overlying lens as a visible minority woman of a certain age and all of the life experiences that that brings. So using these various uh, different lenses, I'm going to briefly touch on five key issues so and to encompass a problem that we're discussing today. First, the shadow pandemic. There can be no economic security without physical security. As we're all entering the third wave of this pandemic, gender-based violence has also increased. The reality is, is that the pandemic has created an additional barrier for vulnerable women. They're afraid of going to shelters. They're afraid of calling for help because there's no privacy, no opportunity, and their abuser is right there monitoring their every move. This is what I've heard from shelter operators and partners across the province. This is what I've heard from victims of domestic violence. And we also know that Indigenous women, LGBTQ2S plus people, and women with disabilities experience higher rates of gender-based violence. So once again, I repeat, there can be no economic security without physical security. Now let's talk about unemployment. The numbers don't lie. Women's rates of unemployment were and, and are significantly higher than men. And this is only one aspect of employment that impacts women. Another less obvious impact is that women in leadership roles are considering downshifting their careers due to stress, burnout, and the fact that the double shift of office work and household work has now turned into a triple shift with additional COVID related responsibilities. And it's a lot to take on. Many of you who are listening can relate. Many of you are taking on this triple shift. I know that I am. Losing women in senior leadership roles would be devastating, not only because of their significant contribution to rates of return, because we know what we bring to the table, but losing senior women in the pipeline who are poised to enter the C-suite also means losing sponsors and mentors. McKinsey in the report rightly state that women at all levels could lose their most powerful allies and champions if this happens. And this brings us right into diversity and inclusion policies. We are not where we need to be, absolutely not. Progress has been made, but COVID-19 has revealed significant gaps. Women are having much worse experiences than men as a result of the pandemic. And within women, the experiences are not all the same. Racialized women, LGBTQ plus women, and women with disabilities are facing elevated challenges. 
there are opportunities to do better. Let's move on to the conversation about STEM. There is so much to say, but the reality is, is that women remain underrepresented in STEM fields, especially at senior levels. We are going to see that new technologies and new emergent opportunities will arise and they will be related to STEM fields. And again, there are opportunities to ensure that women gain ground in these fields. And last, but certainly not least of all, is childcare. As a mother of four, I have navigated through every childcare scenario imaginable. Daycares, day homes, before and after school care, grandma, grandpa, preschools, after school sports activities. I have spent countless hours planning my life around childcare options so that I could pursue a career and contribute to my household. I've had to leave a job that I love because I couldn't find childcare. And this was before the pandemic. So this is not a pandemic related issue. Lack of childcare options have always been challenging. So yes, childcare is central, intrinsic and fundamental to the conversation of women and work outside of the home. And I'm inordinately grateful that we're having this conversation now. To conclude my opening remarks, I'd like to say that the challenges are many and we have a long road ahead of us. But I also know that in the midst of all of this chaos, there are many opportunities to do more and to do better. As a policymaker, I place the emphasis on the fact that strong women lead to strong families that lead to strong communities. To create and enhance additional strength in women, I believe we need to galvanize and mobilize and turn the conversation away from women's issues to women's agendas. And those agendas should include what needs to happen to create a shift. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Sony. Thank you. And now, um, Amy Yuska, could you please tell us about what you're seeing in, in the lower mainland of BC? Hi, thanks so much. Everybody can hear me, yes. Um, uh, I'm just joining you today. My name is Amy Yushka, Director of Communications and Advocacy with YWCA Metro Vancouver, and I'm joining today from the unceded and ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And I love seeing Sheila, you with your child there on your lap. It is just so indicative of where we are right now. Um, you know, there's so much that I could talk about, but I really wanted to take a few minutes and, and talk about um, the way that COVID-19 has really demonstrated the precarity of women's employment in Canada, especially when we start to consider intersecting barriers. So race and class, um, gender identity and expression, ability. Um, so really, you know, we see that women are concentrated in low wage and part-time work across our country and in Western Canada. And so these are jobs that, you know, don't have benefits, they don't have pension, um, you know, there aren't always opportunities for advancement, you know, you don't get paid sick days. Um, and so when we kind of look at this landscape and the inequity around this landscape and ask ourselves why, you know, really, at, from the YWCA perspective, we look at the way that our economy has largely been built on women's unpaid labor. And that's something that we really have um, understood more acutely during COVID-19. And so I think that there's, you know, there are two things. One is, is the, the flexibility and the part-time work. And I think that we like to say that women seek out flexibility, that this is a choice um, that they're making when in reality, so many women don't have that choice. You know, they have to be working part-time because they have responsibilities in the home, because women are really responsible for the majority of unpaid care work. And so, you know, the other piece is, is around, um, you know, why are women in uh, low wage jobs? And really it's about how we're valuing women's work. And so, you know, we look at women who are cleaners and who are grocers and who are, um, you know, cooking for us, caring for our elders and for our children. And we are making a decision as society to say, this is low wage work, whereas other forms of work, um, you know, they deserve sick days and benefits and higher wages and advancement. So, you know, I think that that's, you know, two parts of, of the problem when we really look at women and the economy. And, you know, the YWCA 
experience, you know, the women that we speak to who access our programs and services are really reflecting this, you know, they are saying to us that um, they're cobbling together three and four part time jobs, um, you know, they don't have sick days, or they've maxed out their sick days caring for small children, um, that they're really struggling to make ends meet in one of the country's most expensive areas to live. And so that's always a, a big issue. And so, you know, when we're thinking about solutions to this, this is why our feminist economic recovery plan calls for, you know, better minimum wages, for paid sick days, for um, really valuing and investing in the care economy, um, and for really looking at our kind of deep seated uh, gender norms that are playing out both in society and in our homes to address these issues. You know, I think that there is this, um, you know, there's this notion that women have to adapt to reality and really what we need to talk about is adapting reality to women and their lived experiences and it's really only through that that we're going to get to a just and equitable economy. Thank you, Ms. Yuska. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sheila North and uh, Sheila has her grandson on her lap and so this is this is the reality. <laughs> Sheila, can you talk to us about your experiences in, in Manitoba? And I know you, you're in communication with a lot of Indigenous communities and what, they're, what they've seen during the pandemic and how that's influenced the women in, in Indigenous communities as well as Indigenous women living in the city. Yes, thank you for having me. And I am here in the Treaty 1 territory of Winnipeg and uh, also known as the home of the, uh, the Métis. And so I'm, I'm proud to be from Northern Manitoba, Banbanabi Cree Nation. Hi, my name is Sheila and this is Adonis. Um, yeah, it's a really uh, good time to be talking about, especially post budget or <laughs> announcement. And again, yes, this is my grandson. Um, my daughter is off. Um, doing work. She's an entrepreneur. She, she basically runs her own company. And so I volunteer to um, keep him as much as I can, gladly. And this is the reality for a lot of us. And as all of you know, um, and, and women, Indigenous women are no different. What I noticed when I was working throughout the year um, on HR calls with legacy bows and our clients across Canada is that women, mostly women were on the calls. There was of course men, but mostly women on the calls. And they were the ones that were forced to think creatively and diversify. And uh, they were managing uh, HR concerns and issues in their, in their communities. A lot of them were from the First Nations. And so they had to quickly adjust to changing work uh, environments, but also work roles. Th because of the lack of infrastructure and availability of resources on reserves, for example, people had to uh, abandon their normal role and then become some sort of frontline officer or worker in their community, even though they may not have been necessarily qualified um, in the col colonized way with um, certificates and, and all of that. Um, but essentially they became the, the nurses and the aides and, and security even and the encouragers and the child minders. And so um, much like across Canada, I think uh, we saw uh, pan the pandemic really exemplify um, the role women had and the unpaid roles that they have and actually showing more of the need for them. So I think there's moving forward, I, I was encouraged by a lot of things in the budget, but I think that we, we have to go back to some of the traditional ways of, of being even more so to, to, sh to um, address the, the gaps that the pandemic has highlighted. You know, there's a lot of money for childcare and, and who knows how it's gonna be spent yet uh, based on infrastructure, retraining and all that for staff. But also we should be create, creating spaces where family members like myself are supported and my daughter to care for our children and our future generations in the way that we traditionally do is by helping each other, especially in smaller communities and reserves that don't have daycares and centers and, and that, um, that that's been the whole problem with child welfare, for example, 
um, instead of helping women and families support their own children and, and address the needs and the gaps they have and the poverty they live in, their children get taken away. And it would have been more of an inclusive and, lo inclusive and loving environment if we supported women and mothers instead by providing the supports they needed and the resources to raise their children. So I feel like we have an opportunity here to reset a lot of good things and um, I hope we can do it. I hope policymakers are on board to um, to really think back and get creative. So, yeah, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And I think you know that's that's the point is that the lived experience is so different for so many of us, and it's important to have that kind of insight. Whatever solutions we come up with have to have to one size doesn't fit all. And you know, this this may be sexist, but I don't know about you, but one size pantyhose has never fit me. Um, and uh, I find that one size policy has a similar problem. Maybe that's maybe that's where my interest in policy came from. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Melissa Coomber Benson from Regina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you all today uh, from Treaty 4 uh, land, which is home to the Soto, Cree, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people and uh, homeland of the Métis. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, you know, I think I, I'd like to just jump a little bit into um, <clears throat> adding to what Amy and Sheila spoke about a little bit. Uh, because I think the experiences across the country are are very similar in in lots of ways, and and to add to that, um, you know, I think I think we've always had this problem. And Minister Shawnee and I were speaking about this before the, before we started. And COVID nineteen, I think, just really brought a, a big spotlight on something that was already existing. <clears throat> and so, um, one of the things I think that was really interesting for me to experience in our community was this grappling effect of what essential services were. So when early on in the pandemic, there were conversations about, um, you know, what are essential services? And in my sector, I think, you know, we really thought about that. We weren't, I don't think we saw ourselves um, totally as essential services or, or our entire mandate. And, um, and, and as we thought about that, we, we recognized really quickly, well, wait a second, everything we do is essential services. And, um, and that realization was interesting as an introspective piece. Um, and I think our sector saw that. Um, and, and, and I think then we could see that women's work, as Amy spoke about, really made up that bulk of essential services. Um, and, and, and from that, I think what we recognized is that um, you know, through the learning we've had on gender stereotypes, I think women have a capacity to persevere. Our, our women's work perseveres. Um, women leaders within that sector persevere. I think this is something we're taught. Um, uh, and, and whatever is put in front of us, we have the capacity to kind of figure out how to be innovative, change it up and move forward. <clears throat> And this was certainly true of the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, in, in my community, um, you know, women leaders in our sector stepped in and coordinated. We, we brought forward responses to, um, to government, to the health regions. You know, we were the first ones to put out a um, pandemic response plan for our shelter systems one that, that, that could be handled with COVID because we didn't have one. Um, we brought forward coordination with other community organizations and it was the women leading our organizations uh, who did that. I think it, what also came, uh, a realization that came out to me was that when other people and other organizations uh, shut their services, um, you know, women's organizations didn't. We didn't, we figured out how to do this work in a different way. And I think that comes through, um, you know, the learning of our roles as being folks that persevere. And I know that my indigenous friends and colleagues speak about the importance of matriarchy and, and what happens when a matriarch, um, when a matriarch is lost. And, and I can see that sort of playing out even in our sector of women's work. I can see even the nuances of that uh, uh, on the front line. Um, in addition to what Amy was talking about, about not being paid the same as what other folks, even in our sector, are paid. In addition to that, um, we were also asked to, to balance this un, 
unpaid work uh, as well. And, and these, these, this kind of um, double time or triple time as, as, um, as Minister Shani was speaking about. So I think uh, the pandemic I, in our community uh, shone a spotlight on gender stereotypes, how deep rooted those are. Um, it shone a light on un, underpaid essential work and, and shone a light the majority, disproportionately, the majority of folks doing that are women. It shone a light on uh, unpaid work. And, and I think this has touched every family and in every home. Um, you know, and, and it also um, shone a light on the fact that there's a lot of pressure now on women for this recovery as well. I think the research shows and talks about how our economic recovery is really dependent on how well women do because they understand that foundation that exists in our community. And so, so not only has the problem shone a spotlight on what was always there, but now the responsibility of the recovery is also placed on, on uh, women in general. Uh, so that is what I would like to share on on on, on uh, what we've seen here in, in Regina and Saskatchewan. Thanks, Sheila. And thank you for reminding us that the recovery won't happen unless women participate in it. And I think that's so speaking of women participating in the recovery, I'm going to uh, ask Mar uh, Marcella Mandeville to speak about a couple of things. We're going to start to shift the conversation towards the discussion specifically of daycare. We kind of have been going around and around that. But, uh, you know, Marcella, daycare, I think people don't think about, I always make a joke. People say, oh, the freedom to be an entrepreneur, to work for yourself. And I always say, yeah, it's the freedom to work 24-7. Um, that creates some interesting challenges for, you know, our uh, our our, our friends and colleagues who are who are entrepreneurs. Can you just talk a little bit about what you've seen in the entrepreneurial community and then kind of move into the daycare situation? Absolutely, yes. And great comments from, from all the panelists, incredible. I could listen to everyone all day long. Um, but, but definitely entrepreneurship, uh, for those of you out there who are entrepreneurs, uh, it is a diff it's a difficult journey, even without something like COVID being placed on top of it. And for women, there have been uh, additional challenges along the way. Uh, and it was, you know, quite often for many years, um, you know, entrepreneurship and the business world was ruled by men. And it was not a system that was designed for us or by us. And so it has been many years of trying to, to fit into an existing system and also try to create a new one at the same time. So what COVID really has showcased that we've seen from our, the entrepreneurs that we work with across the province of Alberta. And again, I apologize, I didn't, uh, I didn't recognize. I'm very proud to be on Treaty 6 territory. Um, and my families are proud members of Salt River First Nation in Northwest Territories. Um, and we've been very happy uh, ha to have made our home here in Alberta for many years. And, but to speak to that, that the, the entrepreneurship piece, uh, it has been extremely challenging. We've seen a lot of our entrepreneurs are based in service related industries, which were hit particularly hard by COVID. Some of the most, the hardest hit industries in our province are, are significantly uh, run by women, um, like well represented. Finally, we had good representation in some of the industries and sectors. And unfortunately, those were the ones that were hardest hit by COVID. And so of course, there have been lots of um, there have been opportunity, I wouldn't say lots, but there have been opportunities that have emerged to try to help. But what we recognized was a lot of the small businesses did not qualify for a lot of the opportunities for a lot of the programs, the grants, etc. Um, and we're really struggling under the weight of um, the, the responsibility that they felt towards their employees who often are looked at like family. Um, their contractors, their vendors, their community, their customers. Um, and so that was that has been a very big challenge for entrepreneurs, uh, especially with the situation of going through these different waves of COVID. So certainly a lot of, of, of worry, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of stress in particular around money. And money has been a predominant issue, I'm sure on everybody's mind, whether you're an entrepreneur or not. 
but it is certainly something on entrepreneurs' minds because it's not only, it's not their own income that they're most worried about often, it's the income of those that they support through their business. And that's a big weight to carry. So, you know, those, those, are, those are some things that are weighing on people's minds along with working the three shifts, uh, along with taking care of those around them that need to be cared for. Uh, whether it's somebody who's ill or childcare, et cetera. So, but what we also see on the flip side is opportunity for innovation and really interesting solutions that women can bring to the table because of our experience, because of our, sometimes it's our pain that creates this need to build a solution to, to, to find a way through, uh, through the situation. And to tie this into the childcare piece, for example, we've seen lots of innovation in a lot of uh, areas um, where not only do we have solutions that could benefit communities around Alberta, across Canada, but also around the globe, because this is a situation that's impacting the entire earth. Everyone around the globe is being impacted by COVID. So there are some amazing women-led solutions that could make a big difference in the world. And one of these areas is when we look at the more uh, looking at cre more creative or innovative solutions around needs that we have, childcare being one of them, the current childcare model has been around for a very long time and there are some, there's potential to, to change that and to create that flexibility and that, you know, to Sheila's point, engagement, how do, how do family members, how do community, how do, we, how do we get community members, how do we acknowledge all of the people in our extended family and community that support in, in the raising of our next generations. And that's really important. So I think there's really neat opportunities to engage women in building the solutions to actually change some of these systemic issues and create new opportunities for women to engage in employment and the workforce, et cetera, and have a place where everyone feels like their needs around childcare are being met. Thanks, Marcella. Melissa and Amy, you know, I know that the whys have been on the front lines of coping and talk about pivoting and readjusting. What are your, what are your insights into, we all know childcare is, is one of the biggest challenges we're gonna see for women in, in the recovery and just going forward. I mean, talking about spotlights, childcare is the longstanding pro problem. All of us grandmothers have <laughs> lived through it. Um, where do you see, child care going? Any comments on the federal policy? Melissa, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I was looking at Amy to see who was going to start talking. Uh, you know, it, it is, it's, um, it's astonishing that it's taken us, I think, this long to get to a place of recognizing, uh, astonishing it's taken us this long and a global pandemic in recognizing how essential child care is um, to our economy. And, um, and I think, uh, part of that is the undervaluing uh, that has existed for so long. So, so, you know, I think when we tackle our ability to support everyone, not just, um, you know, our very typical um, workforce, I think that we cater uh, our communities to, um, there is no doubt that there's a capacity there to, to be able to have a positive effect on the economy. And so I think, and my hope is that when we start looking at um, childcare as a universal need, as, as, a, as a way in which um, we can support uh, not just women, but we can support families in, in uh, reaching economic security and capacity uh, will have a huge impact in our community. Do you want I'll to add? <laughs> I would love to, um, to be able to say a few words as well about childcare. I could go on all day about childcare, but in BC, we have been building a universal public system since 2014. So we're already well on our way. And I think, you know, the dimension um, of childcare that I wanna bring to this conversation specifically around employment is that 
you know, one thing that we have struggled with in BC is, is recruitment and retention of early childhood educators. And YWCA Metro Vancouver is a child care operator. We have four centers in Vancouver. And this is a really acute issue for us, being able to recruit and retain ECEs. And when we think about, you know, the potential of expanding child care across the country, we have to address this because, um, you know, what we need to do is pay child care workers a living wage, you know, a good wage. They need opportunities for advancement. One thing that we've been advocating for at the YWCA is a provincial wage grid so that ECEs can see what the progression looks like through their field. Um, and, and, you know, that's incredibly important. This is a women majority field as well or sector. And so we need to make sure that women are getting paid. So I think that that recruitment and retention strategy is going to be incredibly important for us to be able to deliver on childcare both in BC and um, across Canada. But the other thing that I'll just mention really quickly is that it's also about a systems building approach. And one thing that we're in the midst of looking at in BC is, is moving childcare to the Ministry of Education so that childcare is delivered the same way that we, that we school children. Um, and with that comes all sorts of regu regulations for childcare workers as well and, and a decent wage for them. And so I think that you know, we, we don't want a fragmented system. We really want a systems building approach to childcare across the country. And I hope that we can look to Quebec's example and soon BC's example for, for how to do this right. Thanks, Amy. I want to pivot now because we've started to talk about solutions and moving forward on the child care front. Um, but I'd like to now, you know, we're, this pandemic will end, but, you know, it will have changed many people's lives. Um, some women may choose not to go back to work. Some, we have, I think, learned how essential our essential services were. You know, Melissa's your comments of like, oh my gosh, everything we do is an essential service. Uh, you know, those those kinds of revelations, we will be different going forward. I want to ask my cat and colleague Janet Lane uh, to to pivot a little bit and talk about um, for those women whose jobs won't come back, uh, for those women who have decided that they do want to change whether to become entrepreneurs or move into a different sector. Janet is, has done so much work. If you're interested in this, the Canada West Foundation has a, a really fascinating series of reports that Janet has done over the past five years on basically one problem, matching people with jobs and jobs with people. That sounds easy, but we all know how hard that is. So Janet, over to you. Thanks, Colleen, and good afternoon to everybody. I, I must say how much of a pleasure it is to be part of such a great group of women. I was, frankly, I was noticing this probably the first panel I've been on when it was all women. So thank you for this. Um, I want to jump right into this. How do we get women back into the workforce? And because we have heard recently from RBC, as as Minister Sani uh, and others have mentioned, this RBC report that of, of all the women who left the workforce in the last year, there's probably a hundred thousand or so that aren't even looking for another job right now. Uh, they've decided that it's, um, it's better to just be home uh, with their families or to be upskilling or whatever it is doing. And sometimes they may have just given up hope. Um, so what do we need to do to get people uh, women especially back into the workforce besides the you know quality early learning and childcare which we've just talked about if and when they want to you know nobody's going to force women back to work but I would imagine that a, a large number of them are going to want to um, so first let's look at the kinds of jobs that women are most likely to get back into where is the demand going to be and you know there was some occupation projections done prior to the pandemic that are believed to still stand so, you know, by 2028, uh, you know, we expect that most of the demand in these sectors that I'm going to mention is going to continue. Five of the top 10 industries that are projected to grow over the next seven years are, women, are jobs uh, and sectors that have been dominated by women. So, um, although they may be out of the workforce right now, it's projected that they'll be able to move back in. We can expect that healthcare, social assistance, professional services, food services, and elementary and secondary education in that order 
will continue to grow at slightly more than the average um, over the next few years. And so women will have opportunity to move back into those sectors. But as Melissa said, there is a, this, these are often the sectors that have been highlighted through this, through the pandemic. Uh, they've also lost a lot, a lot of women or really impacted women in, in very negative ways. Many of the jobs that women have traditionally done were lower paid and required lower levels of skill. And that is changing. So the, because the pandemic has offered employers the opportunity to, to move more into a digital economy and to, to digitize a lot of those jobs. In fact, digitization has been so accelerated, we're hearing that it's actually gone forward about 10 years beyond where we expected it to be uh, prior to the pandemic. So for women to go back into these sectors, they're going to need to increase their digital skills. I don't mean that they're going to learn to have to, have to learn how to code, but that they'll need to be able to use technology in new ways to accomplish tasks that they may not have been able, they may not have been asked to do in their old jobs. So jobs are changing. Let's keep that, that one in mind. Even older um, traditional jobs. And um, women have also dominated some of the sectors that are expected to grow the least over the next few years. Um, retail trade, post-secondary education and public administration are expected to actually decline. Although frankly, I don't know why post-secondary education is going to decline. We're gonna to need to upskill and reskill and you know everybody, but that's another story. The projection is that it's going to go down. Women who have been in these sectors and there has been a lot of them, may actually have to reskill completely or find new ways to apply the competencies that they already have um, in new ways. So, so of course, and th there is also the, the desire to move more women into new sectors or sectors that they have not traditionally dominated. And um, let's, let's cheer for that. Um, but we need to be able to find ways to help women learn, grow and lead in these new sectors. Now, fortunately, as we've mentioned, uh, many people have mentioned the federal and provincial governments have noticed this, <laughs> you know, it's loud and clear, and they've begun to allocate money in their recent budgets for upskilling and reskilling. In fact, the number of programs and the amounts of money allocated to this is, has been, or at least it's in theory, and it's just unprecedented. Like we've never seen this kind of money in the past. Billions of dollars have been set aside for all women, for all workers, some of whom are women. And some of these uh, specific programs have been highlighted for women um, only. And that's good. That's really good, except that much of what is planned is very vague right now. The details have yet to be worked out. But that's another good thing, and it makes this conversation really important. Policy wonks like me and the government's uh, Minister Sani and her colleagues at Cabinet, um, other government ministers and other officials, as well as institutions and agencies like the YW that do so much of this upskilling and reskilling work, um, need to get together to ensure that this money that is being allocated is well targeted and meets the needs of women and families. Uh, you know, I can't say enough about that. Some women will need more support than others. And with the plethora of programs that are being devised right now, a lot of us, a lot of women are gonna need a lot of help in navigating what's possible, right? Um, it's like, you don't want, the last thing you want is for a woman to be targeted into a program that actually doesn't fit them. So my recommendations would include that upskilling and reskilling opportunities are as much as possible customized to participants. As Colleen said, one size does not fit all. And that they are primarily demand driven. That is that they have to be uh, worked out in conjunction with employers. Let's not tell women, if you take this program, there's a good chance you could get a job. Like, let's not do that anymore. Let's have jobs, let's have the programs lead into jobs. Because if, if uh, they don't, hopes are raised, energy is depleted, and mental health suffers. And we've all, we've all experienced a little change in our mental health over this last year.
We need to also include wraparound services for women so that they get the support that they need to learn. It's not just childcare, sometimes it's, as I said, navigation into the right program. It might be income supports. It may be helping them to understand how, how to get back into the learning. Learning, again, if you haven't been learning recently, you may need to actually upgrade your literacy and numeracy skills before you can increase your other skills for other jobs. And as, as, as Colleen um, alluded, it's got to be competency-based. That is that we have to understand what are the competencies that are required by the jobs in the economy, and you gotta find that out from employers. And then we have to figure out what competencies people have already built. Don't put them into a program where they're already half qualified. Like just don't waste time doing that. Individual women need to be assessed for their competencies prior to starting any course of, of, of uh, learning. And a lot of that is going to be online. So there's going to be some opportunity for agencies to do that assessment to get people started. They might not have to actually provide the content, but they'll need to help women understand where they're at. And then let's just build the competencies that are required. This is what I mean about customization. This will help save time. It will help women to get employed more quickly and it will meet the demands of employers, which is what we need to do if we're going to build the economy through this re recovery and she recovery. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. Um, to the participants who are watching, we've been spotlighting speakers, but uh, us panelists can see all of us, uh, can see each other. And as Janet was speaking, there was a whole lot of head nodding going on. So um, I, I just wanted to, to want to, there was a whole lot of, yeah, me too going on as Janet was speaking. So we're at uh, 1247. Um, I actually wanted to go back quickly to Sheila because she's in the HR business. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that she mentioned that really struck me is when Janet talked about competencies and recognizing competencies, when I've had uh, Indigenous students, and this is probably true for Indigenous students, but people from smaller communities as well, they develop some amazing competencies because in a small community, you can't just look next door for a specialist. People tend to step up and fill those needs that are there in the community. So, you know, Sheila, what do you see going forward happening on the employment front? Well, yeah, I was going to say that as well, what, um, what Janet just talked about, and, and I'm not sure which report you were quoting, but you're saying that university programs might, the attendance might be going down. And I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing, because I think um, we've been putting a lot of value and base almost solely on people getting degrees and certificates to do certain jobs. Whereas lived experience and traditional knowledge is not valued in the same way. So do we have the opportunity to relook at how we qualify women, especially, and lots of men as well, of course. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, there is a need for that. I know that that was a topic of discussion in another RBC report, actually, saying that um, that people's lived experiences have to be valued in a different way and and um, maybe this is the time to to do that and um, I think that uh, there are many times women want to uh, participate in certain roles and economies and, and after we figure out and, and take care of the child care piece um, the women entrepreneurs I know that there are a huge contingency of Indigenous women entrepreneurs and if they could be successful the nations would be really successful but right now we see cases of MMIW missing and murdered indigenous women and girls because their vulnerability as indigenous women and girls in large part have been compromised and and utilized for other things and so if we can strengthen the the women we would strengthen families and whole nations because of that so um, you know, procurement is another piece that we, we hear about. And if we're really serious about supporting businesses and entrepreneurs, I think we need to be serious about supporting them in, in real 
you know, ways that are, are stated and, and enhanced by policies, new policies. So um, we do have, again, I always like to be offered, you know, look at opportunities and also look at, while we look at the challenges, look at the opportunities. I think that uh, we have plenty of it. And, um, you know, even when you're talking about uh, the lower level jobs being lower paid, like, I think we all know that, you know, the people that ended up doing the front lines at grocery stores became really valuable compared to other roles that maybe even athletes that are paid millions of dollars, right? Do you, would you rather watch somebody playing a sport or go buy your groceries that you need in the limited time you get to go out during restrictions? So I think um, uh, there, there have been values shifted and women have always been uh, a big part of this needed conversation and I'm glad there's more recognition for it. Thank you, Sheila. I just want to hand it over to Marcella and give a little plug for the uh, online programs that they have, both for women and who are thinking of starting up a business, as well as their leadership program for women who want to take their business to the next level. So two minutes, Marcella. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right. Thank you so much. So Alberta Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, so we have, we are not for profit organization. We just celebrated our 25th year. We have a program for digital transformation, uh, particularly around leadership competencies for women entrepreneurs. So to actually look at what is needed to grow your business through technology and, um, and through a, a program coaching, uh, access to experts, be able to create a plan for uh, digital transformation and actually start to implement it. So we just launched that program in January. We're very proud of it. Really excited to, to see the potential. Um, open to women in uh, women across Alberta currently. We hope at some point to make it available, you know, uh, across Canada. Um, and we're just completing our pilot phase of the project. Uh, and that was through the support of Western Economic Diversification, uh, thankfully. Um, and then we also have programs for starting a business. We also have a program for Indigenous women entrepreneurs, aspiring and existing. Um, and we work directly with communities to deliver that program. So we're currently looking at uh, building out a digital uh, component of that program to make it accessible while we're not able to gather and meet in person during COVID. So we have a variety of programs and services. Our website, of course, I, I hope will be shared, awebusiness.com. And um, you, can, you can look at all the different programs that we make available. And currently most are free or a very significantly low cost. And they are many of our webinars um, and programs are open to uh, to women across Canada. So we invite you to join our community. It's an amazing community of women in Alberta, and we love to support each other. And we would love to support you. Thank you very much, Marcella. Now um, we all know the whys in our communities uh, are amazing, and so I will just if anyone has questions, direct you to your local why because I'm sure they have lots of answers. I want to give the minister just a, a couple or three minutes. I asked her to start. And so it seems only fair if I can give her a few minutes to wrap up at the end. Thank you, Colleen. Well, let me just uh, say what is probably on everybody's mind. This has been an incredibly rich conversation. I mean, we just haven't had enough time to really hit on all of the issues that we wanted to, but uh, I just want to talk about a few things that's happening on the government side before we all sign off. Uh, number one, Janet was uh, talking about the fact that digitization has been accelerated. We know that's true. And in fact, half of the 35% of the automation jobs in Canada have been held by women. So there is definitely going to be a necessity to ensure that we have rescaling and retraining capabilities. And we are going to be making some announcements in the future in regards to jobs and training. So I would just like to alert everybody to be please ready for that. And um, I do have a number of members of uh, the Premier's Council on Civil Society and Charities who are here today. And they had put together a report a few months back, which resulted in the ministry funding organizations like Sheikh Geek, which actually invests in women 
who are wanting to transition into STEM related fields. So that is very much on our radar that we need to support this retraining and, uh, and uh, upskilling. Um, Janet had also said some women will be needing more support than others. And Marcella had said, sometimes it's our pain that requires us to find the solution. So when it comes to the shadow pandemic and domestic violence supports, I can tell you we're going to be undertaking a lot of work in that area. And again, we just funded some organizations who are working on data aggregation, because if we can get the data across the province that um, exists in disparate systems right now and get it together in sort of a one type of repository, it's going to help us to make better decisions. So this work is underway and we're connecting with all of our community partners across the province to make sure that these conversations are happening. I would be remiss in not mentioning that as we're having all of these discussions, it's very important to also talk about the experience of newcomers and racialized communities and persons with disabilities or anybody who's experiencing additional barriers as well. And certainly the government is looking at a variety of different ways to make sure that we have built that equity piece in some of the programs that we are going to be introducing. And I will just end by saying that my colleague, uh, Minister of Children's Services, Rebecca Schultz, she has put together a Supporting Alberta Working Parents Advisory Group to talk about what childcare will look like in the future. And within my ministry, I'm very proud to say that we've got the Premier's Council on Civil Society and Charities who are going to be looking at women and economic recovery and recovery in general. And actually, I don't personally like the word recovery that much. I'd like to reframe it from the perspective of strong women means strong communities. And the council is going to be helping me in this endeavor. So thank you very much, Colleen, for this opportunity. And thank you to all of you for joining today and participating. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This. <laughs> I think everyone is sitting here going, we could spend the whole afternoon. Colleen, why didn't you give us more time? Uh, and so um, I apologize for that, but we had a we had a good snack and we look for it. I don't know about you, but I feel inspired by this. And uh, you know, to go forward and and as a policy shop, we're obviously on these kinds of issues, but I think all of us uh, are are thinking about how do we how do we go forward and move forward so um thank you panelists i truly appreciate your participation your response in very quick time um and thank you for helping everybody thinking about how they in their own way will go about solving the problems that that we've discussed today if you want to review this uh event or share the post please visit us at cwf.ca and if you're inspired to join us for more inspiring conversations, please subscribe to our list. I want to thank you all and have a truly wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye for now.